National History Academy, and we're happy to be coming at you live from Facebook with Indiana Dunes National His National Park. Um, and guiding us today virtually will be uh, Park Ranger uh, Kirstine Gerlach. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So I'm on now. Yeah, okay. if you, yeah, 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 pull up the PowerPoint. I will do that. Um, sharing screen, hit that button, hit that button. Beautiful, love it. Okay, slideshow, we're working on it, bear with me. I'm at a building called the Douglas Center for Environmental Education and Technology Works Slower in this part of the western part of the park. So, okay. Um, didn't give you much of an introduction, but I will now that I have a beautiful slide up here. I, I'm Christine Gerlach and I'm a park ranger. I do a lot of education at Indiana Dunes National Park. We were a lakeshore from about 1966 up until 2019. And we almost were not a lakeshore at all. We were supposed to be a national park at the beginning of the 20th century. That didn't pan out because a war came along and people shifted their attention to other things. So that kind of got put on the back burner. But because people never forgot about saving the dunes and citizens literally went from door to door and knocked on people's door to get them to sign petitions and seat people from outside of Indiana to help save the dunes, I am sitting here today talking to you. Everything's connected and everything matters. So with connections, let's look at Indiana Dunes National Park symbol. When you go to some of the 400 different places of national park places in the country, you'll see that symbol. And it means things. It's everything on that little placard represents something in our national park. The bison represents the wild, wildlife, and the sequoia tree represents the flora, the plants, and the mountain rep represents the landscapes, including Lake Michigan, which is in our park, and the dunes. And then, then finally, the arrowhead shape re represents the history of from Native Americans and everything else. So um, we really are here for the people and it belongs to us. That said, let's see what we have to show you in this park. Indiana Dunes is unique. I suppose all of the 400 some places are unique, but I like to say we have the, and all language teachers, close your ears. We have the uniqueness of the uniqueness. So we are a small park compared to some, but look at out of 400 places, we rank seventh in biodiversity of plant species. And one of the reasons is because we have so many habitats and I'll show you a couple of those today. And we have a lot of people. We're, we're real close to Chicago where I sit at the Douglas Center. Uh, if you look at the map, everything in green is property of Indiana Dunes National Park. And we're on the far left side of your screen in Gary. So I am sitting at an environmental education center called the Douglas Center in Gary. And then we're in Lake County, Indiana. And if you go all the way to the east, about 14 some miles, you'll end up in Michigan City, Indiana and LaPorte County. And then Porter County is in between. And there's a pretty tan area in amongst all our greenery. That is the Indiana Dunes State Park. And remember I said we're trying to become a national park in the early part of the 20th century and then attentions got diverted. So the state of Indiana, again, with citizen science is picking up the slack, they created a state park. They wanted to save at least some part of the dunes. Originally, the state park was supposed to be a lot bigger, but it's about three miles long and about 2,000 acres. So then 40 years later, uh, we knew there were more dunes to save. I didn't, but the people here did, and they, created what you see in the light green. There's still mills in between places of the national park and again, unique. So, okay. We're gonna take you to some of those places that are in the green on that map that you're looking at. The far left corner is a fall picture, of course. Um, 
the sumac, the blueberries. We have tons of low bush blueberries on the sand dunes. We have beaches and dunes with grasses growing on them in the right picture. And then we have plenty of wetlands. And because of those wetlands, we have that great, great biodiversity of plants because they add so much. They hold so many natural organisms. And happens to be at the bottom of a dune, which was scoured out probably by wind. We call that geological feature a blowout. So, and, and I want you to focus also on that colorful picture. That's not a forest and it's not a prairie. Prairies are dominated by grasses. That is the mixture of grasses and forests called an oak savanna, which is a very rare habitat that is right outside my door of the Douglas Center. But most people come to Indiana Dunes National Park for this habitat. And that is our beautiful, beautiful beaches. We can get to the beach rather close or walk just a short while to get to the beach. And if you like beach walking, you can do that to your heart's content because we have a variety of places for you to go. And if you're at a place called West Beach, you will see a bathhouse that looks like this. And it's built with showers and a concession stand in the summer. Uh, this time of year in February, you walk down from the a parking lot and it's about a five minute walk. It's a flat sidewalk. You can see the sidewalk material there. And you leave your car at the parking lot, walk down the sidewalk, walk through the house, and then you get down to the lake. And it doesn't look like that today. Uh, it's full of white shelf ice. That's very highly dangerous to walk on. Don't do that. Um, but in the summertime, it looks like this. Usually there's a lot more people there, but luckily we got that picture. It's probably six o'clock in the morning. So West Beach has its trails. Um, oh, might have been wondering what the heck Diane. Our trails, it has a little under 500 stairs. And then you come to the visitor center or us here at the Douglas Center will give you a patch that said you survived this Diana of the Dune stair. Um, Diana was a lady who came to the dunes before there were any parks from Chicago and she kind of lived off the land and her name wasn't Diana, it was Alice. But um, people saw her back in the early you know, hundred years ago and women living off the land and shacks of driftwood, well, they thought her up. As I didn't you might look it up. Going to other legends, Miller Woods, outside my door at the Douglas Center, has that rare oak savanna habitat. And we don't want too many trees. We love our oak trees. The animals love our oak trees. But if we get too many trees, we get too much shade. And then we lose the sunlight. And then we lose the prairie grasses who thrive on sunlight. And the prairie flowers, we don't have an oak savanna anymore. We have an oak forest. So to add this ingredient into the habitat, we have prescribed ferns where you kill some of the oak trees and the prairie grasses thrive on the fire because their roots are so deep into the ground. And we have this beautiful oak savanna, which is this rare habitat. And that's a typical picture of the wildfire folks and their Nomex, N-O-M-E-X, which is fire retardant clothing out there doing that prescribed burn. And after that's done, then we'll have these beautiful oak savanna habitats. On the other side of the park, uh, going back to that green map, there were some blotches of green that were kind of, kind of disconnected from the lake. This is one of them. This is one of our wetlands called Pinhook Bog, named after a place close by called Pinhook. But the bog is, is also connected to Lake Michigan, even though it's 10 miles south of it, because as the glaciers were here thousands of years ago, a piece of that glacier broke off and it sat and it melted and it formed all these deep lakes. You walk in, it's really deep, real fast, like a kettle. So they're called kettle lakes. But this one had a clay bottom. When you get a clay bottom, you don't get a lot of drainage. It's like a, a bowl of cereal with all the different ingredients of plants make up in your, your cereal mix. And so Pinnock Bog has this neat plant called sphagnum moss that has grown over it. And you can actually kind of walk on this waterbed of plant material called sphagnum moss. 
And because the water in the bog is really low in oxygen and nitrogen because there's no drainage, then all these plants have gather insects. Don't make their own food from the sun. This, this poor nutrient wetland, it's kind of like a wet desert. So there's carnivorous plants in here. This is one of the three. This is the biggest one, and it's probably a big four inches high. And it's called pitcher plant because um, it's like a pitcher. But if, if the insect gets on those little hairs, it's a one way street to the bottom that collects with rainwater, and then they fall to the bottom and they get digested and the pitcher plant lives on. So you can visit these places in the park, all these places I'm showing you today, but pinhook bog is so special and rare and fragile that you actually need a ranger on special guided hikes to go out there with you, which we offer. We're offering more now that hopefully COVID's getting less intrusive. Historic areas of the park. We are a park with nature, but we have historic areas as well. Bailey Chelberg represents a um, man named Joseph Bailey, who was one of the first settlers who was non-Native American to settle in this area. He was born up in Canada. He came down here in the 1800s with his wife, and they kind of carved out this homestead. So the building on the left represents a model of his fur trading cabin because he was a highly invested in trading furs, mostly beaver furs, but it was, he was starting to get out of it when he was here, but he still did a lot of trading. That beautiful picture on the left is Chilbert Farm. I'll explain Chilbert Farm more in a second. If I take you inside of the fur trading cabin, we've set up some furs that we have purchased. They're not here from the 1800s. Uh, none of that stuff. <laughs> some of the wood of the building, but nothing else. So we've put cements between the logs to keep the mice out. It doesn't, not that good job. But we, we do try to keep them out. And then we put up the furs for school kids and special programs. Most of the furs you see in this picture are beaver. There is a, a bear right in the front. Um, there's some trade goods in the back on the shelves. And if you draw your attention to that black thing in the middle of the desk there, that is, that's a hot fashion item. That is the beaver felt hat. And that is why the demand for beaver was so high in the probably 15, 16, 1700s or so. We almost trapped it to extinction. But then luckily a new material came on the block called silk from China and the beaver fur hat went out of style. Consequently, the demand for beaver went out of style as well. So, but we're not that far down yet. We're, we're showing the beavers and the trading and the beaver felt hat. That hat that sits in the center is all beautiful and smooth and they can dye it any color they want. But they had of course take the beaver furs to the factories and usually the factories were over in Europe. And so there were folks that carried them across the oceans and first in canoes and then bigger boats. And just a little trivia, uh, you've, if you ever heard of Alice in Wonderland, there was a Mad Hatter. Well, beaver, to, to make that beautiful felt hat, required a chemical called mercury. And slowly, mercury will get into your system and drive you batty. So the Mad Hatter is connected to the beaver felt hat. But so with the Native Americans were here before Joseph Bailey, obviously, and, and we adapted and kind of just adopted a lot of their new modes of transportation and their words like Michigan. Um, Michigan, Lake Michigan is a Native American word. All four of the Great Lakes are Native American words except superior, which is French. So the canoe building out of bark from the trees and the wigwams, no, not a lot of teepees in Northwest Indiana because bison were here, but they weren't plentiful. So trees were plentiful. It said you could get on a tree at the Mississippi River and get the squirrel could get off when it hit the Atlantic Ocean. There were so many trees. So the tree bark and trees were the structure of making all their homes and the canoes. So the Voyagers, they're here. Uh, Joseph Bailey worked hand in hand with the Voyagers. They were like our modern day truck drivers. And they took the goods in 90 pound packs or so and got them onto the canoes and 
paddle down the wet highways of the rivers and off to the ocean to get on the bigger ships and then turning them into a, a beaver falcon. Joseph Bailey lived in a log cabin when he was here. And if you look around on the left, there's a log cabin. But if you look on the right, there's a house made out of bricks. And if you look in the middle, there's a huge house that he did not live in. But we don't really know exactly what his house looked like in 1822 to 1835. So we have this house here in the middle, and that's what his grandchildren, his children and his grandchildren lived in. And that's the way the house looked in 1917 which is still pretty old. And so that's what you will see if you come here and walk the Bailey Homestead grounds. Today they were there. And they were they had purchased from the government. And so these immigrants, and there was a lot of them. And so they bought land from Joseph Bailey and they carved out their own farm little and now bricks were more plentiful and they were able to build their second house out of bricks from a nearby brickyard. Their first house was made out of wood back around 1874, but it burned down. So after having to sleep in the barn for a while and built the next house out of bricks. So the Chelberg farm, about an, it's like a 1900 farm that we try to preserve with the windmill and the solar and water. The granary is the cute little box building on the right to house your oats and your wheat. And then there's the kitchen is the gray area off the main brick area. That kitchen is real modern because it was built in the 1930s. And the uh, brick house was built in 1885. So. But that's um, what you would see if you walk down to the Chelbert Farm. You'd see the barn if you look the other direction. And due to staffing levels, we try to keep as many different kind of animals that they had for visitors to come and enjoy. We, we rely on volunteers to come morning and evening to feed them and clean up after them. So we do have right now a couple of cows and chickens and a rooster and sometimes we have turkeys and sometimes we have goats but it depends on who's available to come and take care of them they don't belong to us at the farm the farmers in the nearby area are just letting them hang out here for a while if you go to the farm and walk down the trail you'll see this shack and it's not used but one time during the year and this is the and that there's a door on the roof. And if we didn't have it, it would get so steamy in there because that is the sugar shack. And if you open up the doors to the sugar shack and you fill the evaporating stove pan that evaporates maple sap into maple syrup, you will get 40 gallons of steam coming off. And that's why you have a, a door on the top that you would open up. And we kind of adapted making maple syrup and maple sugar from the, um, the Native Americans. That's another object that we adapted and adopted from them. So they were here first and they were making maple syrup and maple sugar from the sugar maple trees. Uh, they didn't have the metal utensils at first that, that we use today to make them. And in fact, today we use plastic to make maple syrup. But when it was first starting out, you had, I know in this picture you have metal buckets, but trade, 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 trade items. Before metal, you have clay pots or you have wooden buckets and you put in something to get your sap hot. So if you take a wooden bucket, first you get it out of the tree, get your sap in a wooden bucket. If you carry a bucket full of sap like that to a, a fire, because you have to heat the sap up, well, you're not going to have a wooden bucket anymore. So you had to put special items into that bucket. And one of the items was stones. And as you collect the stones and you put them into cold sap, it will boil and boil and boil. And eventually it will turn into maple syrup. syrup. Boil it longer, it'll turn into maple sugar. If you look at the bottom of the picture here, there's a log with a lot of holes in it that looks like Reese's peanut butter cups. That's maple sugar that we made at Chelbert Farm during maple syrup season, which is this time of year. And we made it from actually taking hot rocks and putting them in the sap buckets and boiling 
boiling it away. Yes, there's other items there. There's a turkey feather that, that fans the flames. Um, the lots of wood bowls to collect. There's bones. We, we put this out for display. We don't really need to use bones to make maple syrup, but we're trying to set the scene a little bit. There's a couple clay pots in the picture, a turtle shell it, that would make a nice bowl maybe to eat out of. So um, just something to show people what it, some tools they might have had. And as I was saying, if you put enough hot rocks into your wooden bucket, you will get boiling and boiling and boiling. It's not an easy job and it's not a fast job. And if you go to the store, your maple syrup will cost you more even today with our modern equipment than your corn syrup, which looks like maple syrup. And it might smell like maple syrup. But a lot of people say it doesn't taste like maple syrup. And in today's world, um, inside that sugar shack, we have the evaporating pan, which making all that steam that goes out the hole in the roof, um, the way that Chelbert did in the 1930s. And if you think about the 1930s, our whole nation was going through a hard time. Then with the Great Depression, money was scarce. These were farmers, and you don't farm a lot in April, or I mean in February and March. So if you're sitting on a farm that has tons of maple trees, you can, so to speak, farm the trees, and they did. And they made money, and they sold their maple syrup, and that helped them out. If I take you guys into the future just a little bit, I'm still in history here, but we have so many different things of nature and so many different items of history besides Bailey Homestead and Chelbert Farm. Now I'm taking you all the way to a place called a century of progress. And this is taking you to 1939. Um, there was a World's Fair in Chicago and it was called the century of progress. And it was all about how far we've come in, in 1939. There was another World's Fair in 18... 99, somewhere around there. And it was all about the Columbia's, Columbus discovering America. And it was all called the White City. And if you watch your theater soon, I think there'll be a movie out soon called The Devil in the White City. And that goes off of the first Chicago World's Fair. We won't go into any of that, but it's kind of cool. So then 40 years later, they had the Century of Progress the, and the, another World's Fair. These homes were in a section of the World's Fair that were showing modern air conditioning and dishwashers and garages. And so there was this real estate developer over here in the dunes area, not in the park, but he was making a subdivision and he wanted to entice people to live in this place called Beverly Shores. So he either, he barged some of these buildings across Lake Michigan from Chicago, and if they were too heavy, he put them on a semi-truck and shipped them around the lake. He had about 19 houses, give or take one or two, from the World's Fair. They're all gone. They burned. They were taken down. Who knew that we would want to see them today, right? So at one time, private people lived in these homes. And now they are owned by the, your R Park, and they are leased out through the Indiana landmarks to folks who are, don't own them. But they, that set aside, they live in them. They just had to rehabilitate them because they were neglected a little bit. And into our world today, if you drive down in Beverly Shores, you will see these homes looking like this. This is the Florida Tropical House to represent hurricane strength walls made of concrete that would last whole Florida hurricanes. It's not really concrete, but um, that's what it represented. And then you'll see the Armco Faro house made off of Armco steel. This is a steel house and it's kind of like a cardboard corrugated box that you could kind of, you wouldn't want to literally do it, but you could flip it on its side and it would be the same kind of structure all the way around. And so it's the Arco steel ferro wallpaper. And then um, Rostone, R-O-S-T-O-N-E, that was made out of a newfangled material that was gonna last the elements. But um, it's been refurbished by this, this 
brilliant material that this man found. I don't know what material he used. We do open up the houses usually one weekend in October through the Indiana landmarks. And there's huge tours that go through these. And the, the folks that live there are usually on hand to answer questions. And there's a ticket you have to buy. They sell out in about five minutes. Um, but we haven't done that the last couple of years because of COVID. Um, I don't know what this September will look like, hopefully better. Then there's the fourth house is the Cypress house. And uh, yeah, that's wood from the Cypress, the, the, the roof, the, the wood, the indoor fireplace and so forth. Everything was showcasing Cypress. And then finally, this house does not look like this in the Indiana Dunes today. It's all plastered up with that construction material being protected. But at the fair, it, it's called the House of Tomorrow. And at the fair, it was huge windows that were going to let in all the light and so forth. And in fact, the, the, they said, oh, you're not going to be able to heat that house. But the heating room was fine. The air conditioning couldn't handle all the solar energy that was coming in. And then the bottom, you can't see it from the picture, but there was an airline, a air, little airplane garage. So that's what the idea was that we were all going to own airplanes at that time. So those are just some of the examples of the history at Indiana Dunes National Park, going back to the nature because you got to have both. And um, just briefly, I'll explain, we got the turkey tail mushrooms there for you to view, and there was a skunk cabbage and a ghost that just moved it forward. Um, and then there was a small butterfly. But um, the dunes are a special place to visit from this scene up in our Oak Savannah, going back to the Oak Savannah. You can tell that there was actually in this picture a prescribed burn, because if you look closely at all the tiny trees, those have been burned over. The big trees last, the bark protects them pretty well. But that is the end of the slides for you folks today. And hopefully that has enticed you to come out and, and visit us. Awesome, awesome presentation. And uh, well, with the help of uh, a fellow intern here at the National History Academy, Anjali Rose, uh, we will go through some questions. So Anjali, you can get started with one from the chat. Yes, hi, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, so just the first question to start things off, you mentioned efforts to save the dunes. So what are the biggest threats to the dunes today? Um, recently, we've had some boo-boos from the neighboring factories that spill a few things into the, the nearby waterways. And that's been on the news, so some of you might have heard about that. And so that, unfortunately, has happened recently. So we've got to watch that. And when that happens, we sometimes have to close the swimming. You know, you don't want to get in the lake. And then we take tests and make sure that the water is OK. That said, if there's not the pollution from a factory, and that is not common, it, um, and luckily it is rare. If, there's too much rain. Sometimes the sewage system of the nearby towns, and we are there's people everywhere around this park. Sometimes they can't hold all that rainwater, and then some of the the backage goes up back up into the lake, and then we test for E. coli every day in the summertime, and then we run and see and make sure the level of E. coli is okay and safe. So that's that's a hazard. It used to be more of a problem, but we've we've gotten better at cleaning up um, runoff from heavy rains, or maybe there just hasn't been as many heavy rains as there were a few years ago. So those are some of the things. And there's litter at times. Um, some of the worst litter, unfortunately, is when people let plastic balloons go up into the sky for memorials or birthday parties. Those balloons of plastic and those long strings, they come down and then they strangle. Wildlife sometimes get some wrapped around their necks or they eat them. So those are some, there's, there's hazards, but 
those are the ones that come to mind. So those are things that, especially the last thing that we have a lot of control over. Yeah, that's unfortunate to hear, but I'm sure everyone here watching now has a new enthusiasm to protect such sites. Let's see, we have um, one question from a Facebook. We have uh, one of our questions from a Facebook viewer. Wonder who thought to tap trees for the sap? Not the usual thing I would have ever thought about if living hundreds of years ago. Yeah, um, we don't know their stories. And let's pretend, and I don't know if it's true, but during this time of year when there's, we have the right climate, we are the only place in the world, the Northeast pretty much area of the United States and Canada. And if you look at the flag, what's on their flag? Um, this part of the world has the right climate to make maple syrup because you need a freezing night, freezing nights and warm days. And those freezing nights and warm sunny days of 40 and 50 for a while will build up gases inside of the xylem and phloem, the veins of the tree. It causes a pressure, a lot of pressure. So if you were to put a hole in that specific species of tree, and any maple will do this. The sap will not flow out like a fire hydrant, but it will drip, it will drip like a heartbeat. Drip, 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 drip. It will fill buckets in not too much time. And it doesn't have to be a person making a hole in that tree. It could be a branch that has broken off from a windstorm. And then, then there's these sickles, because then it freezes, so there's a sickle of ice, but it's sap ice and it's sweet. So we I'm pretty thirsty. So you went over and you broke it off and you ate the icicle and you thought there's a little bit of sugar taste to this. They discovered it. They were making maple syrup and then maple sugar, which is much easier to transport, stepped into the forest, but then, you know, it's pretty delicious. So that's another thing that we adopted into our world. Thank you. Um, another question. Earlier, you talked about all of the different habitats that are at the dunes. How do you keep up with all of those different habitats? I can imagine that is such a daunting task at times. Um, are there different divisions that take care of each area? How does that work? Our resource management it is is like the Power Rangers. They're out there. They're looking for the exotic of the month. Or they have the year, there's always a new one. And they're either um, doing precise, careful herbiciding, not um, prescribed burners is a method to help old fashioned picking the exotic, alien, aggressive species. We have those folks out there policing these, these foresters that policing the forest and the, and the different habitats to get rid of some of the, the species that are making it a monoculture rather than the diversity of plants that you need for health, for the animals and the insects. Appreciate that. So we're working at it, you know, acre by acre. And then when we get the, the native plants, I don't know them all. I've been here 30 years and I'll never know them all, but I don't care because I love the challenge to keep learning all the different species that are out there. There's books. There's so many books written on the dunes flora. And, and it seems like every few years, a new one comes out. So yeah, it's, it's uh, daunting and it's, a, it's an arduous sometimes, but it's exciting to have this challenge right outside your door. Thanks, yeah, that's does sound like a lot of fun to keep learning. On, on that note, we have a question about how the site manages to balance all the different human stories that are there, all the different people that have been there and buildings and all these stories. How do you manage to tell, for instance, Native American stories well? How, how does that operate? It's a continuous learning process as well. And I'll give you an example right now. There is a, uh, one of our seasonal rangers. He works when we can hire him, though he'd love to work full time. That said, he is now working on a grant through the National Park Foundation. 
and his task is to research dunes. And in fact, I'm pretty sure next month, I think towards the end of the month through the Dunes Learning Center, there will be a workshop virtually on the badass women of the dunes. So check that out. And then he's also making some note cards, um, like, like baseball training cards of these women, um, 12 to 24 or so, and we'll put them on our website and so forth. So we're, it's a, and not to forget the shoulders that, that were here, that we, where we stand on so we can have a park. Thank you. Um, so during your presentation and even during our um, Q&A session, you've been uh, talking a little bit about the different species that live there. Um, I can imagine that there, that you struggle with animal endangerment, um, animal, um, the decline of populations, whether it's by natural causes or by human impact. Um, so are there any sort of animal protection initiatives going on? And if so, what do those look like? Yes, there, there are. I am not up on all of them exactly. I'm going to take you back a few years before I go into the present. A few years back, we realized that we had a small population of this small little blue butterfly called the Carner Blue Butterfly. And when it's a caterpillar, it will only feed on lupin leaves. And lupin will not grow unless there's oak savanna type habitat prescribed fire. And we were doing fine on the prescribed fire, keeping the lupin growing. Sometimes the dunes in behind the double center look like blankets of purple, which is called lupin. And then there was a very early spring and the Carter's blues got messed up. So eggs were being laid too early and then there was a drought. And you know what? We don't have Carter blues anymore in, in that we know of in this park. There's little blue butterflies, but there's a little bit of differences between some of these blue butterflies and the Carter blue butterfly. And so, and we still have lupin, but we don't have this federally endangered butterfly in the park anymore. Then to amphibians. Amphibians are like the thermometer of the natural world because amphibians breathe through their skin. So if there's something in the water that is they're immersed in, they have to stay moist. <laughs> what if they're not moist? So there's enough moisture the um, the frogs and the toads. Toads are a little bit more hardy, but the frogs and the salamanders are not as much. And so if, if they start declining for something, some reason that has leached into the water, you're going to know that that's a thermometer. If they start declining, something's up. So we have biologists that do research on our amphibians of the dunes, and they keep track of the populations. and. Yes, a few of the amphibians are doing better, and there's a few species that aren't doing as well. So why? I, I don't know. I, I haven't read the research papers, and I don't know if they knew. But yeah, that's what we're tracking right now, mostly. We don't want our amphibians to, to go. We got all the species of amphibians we have right now, we want them to stay. Yeah, thank you for elaborating on that. That can be a struggle, I'm sure, as you mentioned about some pollution worries earlier, too. Um, I think we have just one last question. We always like to ask our great guides at, at these sites what advice you might have for young people interested in history or interested in preserving beautiful natural landscapes, um, and maybe how you got to where you are. Well, getting outside and being a good observer is is a key. Um, I think you should get yourself something good to, that you like to use to write and a nice notebook 
and name your notebook your journal and keep track of sights and sounds and smells and feelings of the places you go and maybe you should go out somewhere outside and you should find a place that's safe where you can visit often and make that a place where you can sit down and relax for at least 15 minutes several times a week and call that your sit spot. And then maybe you should keep your journal with you and, and enjoy going to your sit spot with your observations and then learn from there. You don't have to have huge, beautiful landscapes to enjoy what is at hand. There's nature everywhere. And in cities and urban landscapes, there's nature there's as well. You don't have to have a park in your urban landscape. They're nice. But if you observe and slow down and have something to write down your observations with or maybe doodle a picture, nobody's going to grade your artwork. That will help you remember better. And then you can go back to that and start understanding it and learning it. And the more you learn, the more you love and every action makes a difference, positive or negative, it does affect so many other things. Wow, thank you. That's awesome advice. I'm sure like we can all take that with us wherever we go. And with that, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us and thank you, Christine, so much for a great presentation. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome, I enjoyed it. Um, Join us next week National, with the National History Academy as we continue to explore America's beautiful landscape and historic sites. And next week we'll be at uh, Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park at the same time. See you then. Thanks. <laughs>